Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Welcome to the Friday, September 10, 2021 Market Plus. Here's our senior market analyst, John Roach. And John, I had somebody at the Iowa State Fair. You remember the Iowa State Fair when everybody I has an opinion. I love the Iowa State Fair. You do, and you know, and I like it too. I had a couple of people come up to me and says, Paul, why on earth do you cut everybody off and say, very quickly, in 30 seconds, tell me your life story. John, I had to do that at the end of the show. So we were talking politics, specifically food. We finished with the cattle market, the hog market. You started to discuss some food issues at the end. I want you to recap a little bit and continue. I think we have to, uh, uh, we have to have to sometimes take a bigger picture, you know, a 40,000 foot view, if you will, of what's going on out here. And, uh, and we can't ignore uh, the unrest that's going on in the world. Uh, and the uh, supply chain issues that we've experienced, the supply chain issues we are experiencing, and how that impacts everybody around the world. And, and what we've seen so far is that uh, it has helped the demand on food. Uh, and, and, I, and that's a normal thing, and, and we think it's going to continue. We think that, that the right way to look at this market is to just look at some of the obvious situations. The first obvious situation is, what did the last farm in your area sell for? And, how, and what, kind of, uh, what kind of price does it take for commodities to be dealing in that kind of farm value? And then what's the inflation picture look like? And... I experienced a, a couple of different times in my career when markets took off and went to price levels we had not seen before. And, and, uh, and started early was in the 70s to in 1972 when the Russians took all the wheat uh, and the markets uh, in 73 and 74 went to all uh, new high price levels that we had never seen before, doubled the price or more. Actually, dollar corn went to $4 corn. And so here we're in one of those same kind of situations, and we have a market that just came up from very low price levels, and and we were, and now we're we're acting as if they're going to disappear and go right back down again, and they may, but they're not going to do that until we have bigger surpluses of grain or we have more stability in the world, and uh, we won't get bigger surpluses of grain until we know the South South American crops are good, Brazilian crops, et cetera. Uh, and we're not going to settle down the, the uncertainties in the world. Well, I'd like to think we're going to do it tomorrow, but my suspicion is it'll still be pretty uncertain for a few more months and maybe a couple more years. Well, so we're going to farmers have to adjust. Farmers have to adjust for that. I mean, tomorrow is, as we sit here tonight, it's the 10th. Tomorrow's the 11th, September 11th. That's 20 years ago, and we, we say the world has changed forever. I mean, the world's been unstable for, for quite some time. We always think that it's, you know, it goes in cycles, and let's hope that maybe we get on that down cycle. I want to answer your question about land price. I don't know if you heard. I'm sure you did. Last week, there was a farm in Grundy County, Iowa, that went for 22,600 an acre. I just got this bit of information last night. A farm in Jasper County, east of Des Moines, went for 22,000. 500 an acre. So those two big prices, Grundy County, I can, I can see that. That's considered very good farmland in, in Iowa. Do high land prices frighten you, John? Uh, no, I don't know, because they were cheap. I mean, it, 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 not, not so much cheap, but they were steady at the same price for several years. And people paid land off and, and people have accumulated income and the stock market's brought in income. And, and so as a consequence, most of these farms are being sold for cash. I mean, there, it's, not a, it's not a leverage situation. Leverage scares me. But if it's a cash sale, I mean, how can you be scared of that? That farm will, that farm's paid for. And, and so... Smart people in the world, some of the smartest people in the world, are buying farmland because they think prices of food is going to go higher. Uh, we've got a growing population in the world, and um, uh, and now we're headed into rampant inflation. And uh, maybe that's going to change. Maybe maybe they'll have policies that'll take us out of inflation, but I haven't seen one in print yet. So uh, my guess is you better bet on that side. So what that says is that. If you're if you're not if you haven't figured out how to sell high priced markets when you don't know for sure what your crops are out in the country, you're going to have to figure it out. 
because that's the thing you'll need to be doing here uh, in this kind of environment. When you don't know what you have, you have to make business decisions anyway. All right, uh, this is a little off script, but close. Um, say you're somebody new trying to get into farming. Say you're 19, 25, under 30 trying to get in right now, and you're facing these, these high prices, John. What do you do if, if you're someone trying to Find start? Find somebody who needs a person your age to help work their farm and they'll do some sort of a deal that over time you start to accumulate some sort of some assets and some land and so forth so that you'll be able to 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 uh, uh, continue the, the farming career. Uh, you're going to have to find somebody who's willing to help you uh, do that. And the interesting thing is there's, a, there's quite a few people out there that are in that position. I talk to farmers all the time that their biggest situation or worry or problem is I have no one to come farm my farm and they want to keep it in a, in a, and they'd like to stay involved until they die, but they're, they're old. And, and so um, there's opportunities for young people, but if you're going to get into a multi-million dollar business and you're going at, and you're, you're trying to start doing that and you're in your twenties, you're going to have to be really good to do that. I don't care what industry you go into. If you go into agriculture, that's one with high capital requirements, and most 20-year-olds I know don't have high capital situations. So you have to find somebody who's, who needs your labor and who needs your, your strength uh, and your youth, and that's what you have to offer. All right, John, I got a couple of social questions I need to get to because you and I could have this discussion all day. I, I really appreciate always your insight. But uh, I'm going to ask Zach in Lawrence, Nebraska, a uh, simple one here for you, John, off Facebook. Corn and soybeans, hold one, sell one. Which? What was the first one? All right, so he's saying corn and soybeans. Which one do you oh, hold? Corn and soybeans. Which ones do you sell? Uh, you sell, you, you, uh, you try to hold inventory uh, of whatever is uh, easiest for you to hang on to. Uh, and uh, beans are the ones with the tightest supply. Beans are what China seems to be interested in right now. That's be probably the commodity that, uh, that I would favor the most in here. But I think both corn and beans and wheat, I think all three commodities deserve to be held by farmers from harvest into uh, the fall and uh, winter months. All right, so Kurt in North Dakota then is asking, are we done trading the forecast yet? Hmm. We're going to shift. That's a good, real good question. Uh, uh, we still have a little bit more of that in, for as, as amounts to the northern hemisphere, except for wheat. Now, the wheat's just starting. But the southern hemisphere weather has now moved into the front burner place on the stove. So weather is just as important, but it's not the U.S. weather. It's South America. All right, John, I'd like to thank uh, Tim and Justin for your questions. And Phil, I know you asked a very specific question about uh, selling off the combine. I guess I'll just, well, let's leave it at this right now, John. Let's go back to the corn and soybean conversation. A, that you had in the show. B, that you just answered in the previous question. I'm combining. I'm sitting here thinking about selling. What's my percent that I should sell off the combine and take advantage of great prices, relatively speaking? or store some? Is there a percentage breakdown you want to go out on? You know, we've, we've, we've kind of, the problem with percentages is that, that, that if you, you, you give me four different farmer situations and it'll be four different percentages. And so I don't know how to do that, but, but we all can get down to money. Okay. So what we've started to do with people, when we think the market's going to trend higher and we're not in a sell signal, we don't, we just try not to sell at all. But when we hit a sell signal at this time of the year, we sell enough to generate 30 to 60 days cash flow. In other words, I'm going to try to hang on to as much as I can past that. But what I need for cash in the next 30 to 60 days, okay, well, I've got it. I've got to generate that. And so when we get our sell signals at the, what we would say the wrong time of the year, we do 30 to 60 days cash flow. When we get our sell signals that are that have got three and four boxes, we do a fourth to a half of the crop. Makes sense. That is, again, why you are a senior market analyst. And when we have you back on the show, who knows what the market's going to do, right, John? <laughs> <laughs> All right. John Roach, Thanks, good to Paul. see you. Appreciate Thank it. you. All right. That will do it for Market Plus. Next week, we will look at advancements in tracking insects and diseases that threaten crops. And Sue Martin will join us to analyze.
the commodities. Thank you so very much for watching. Have a great week.